Okay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming on, on this Saturday morning. And uh, before I start, I extend my uh, warm wishes and, wel and welcome all of you back to campus. Uh, I'm going to introduce you in a minute, but uh, Ananda wants to say a few words before I do that. Okay, thank you, JP. So, um, you know, on behalf of the Department of Economics, University of Waterloo, welcome home. <laughs> it's so nice to have you guys back. Come on, let's see. The fact that uh, you agreed to take time off your Saturday, it means so much, especially to old, old men like us, right? And, so maybe, maybe just one old man and one like, middle-aged man. Right? Yeah. What did you say? <laughs> but the fact, so you know, so all these students uh, were our students. I remember uh, Sarah was my student in 2003 or? Uh, four. 2004. Three, four, five. Three, four, five. Rob also 2004. Andrew more recently, which are more recently. So, you know, we have a huge panoply out here, and, you know, to see you guys succeed, right, uh, do well in the real world, uh, makes us so happy, makes us feel that, you know, hopefully we had a small little role in it, hopefully we'll find out today, maybe not, but, uh, you know, having seen your successes makes us feel really good, and we're so extremely thankful to you for coming. Um, to back to the university and sharing the wealth of wisdom which you guys have in the real world, which we don't have, and which you can now advise and pass on your knowledge to the next generation. So thank you once again for coming, and um, we hope you have a wonderful day out here. Okay. Okay. So we have a great panel here. I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, the panel and. Uh, then feel free to add anything that, that I've missed or have skipped over. So I'm going to start with, with Shan. Uh, Shan is, was one of the earlier cohorts of our PhD program. Uh, she's a manager, enterprise model, risk management at RBC. Um, Shan has done a lot of really interesting co-op. She was an analyst uh, at Investor Relations Group at Ontario Financing Authority, where she collected data and did research on on investors. Um, Shan did her thesis with Margaret on uh, natural resources. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to Shan before, and one of the things that she said was, MATLAB is a very important skill. So <laughs> you guys are looking at me and always complaining about my MATLAB homework. Uh, Shan will tell you how important those skills are. Uh, so she now does with risk management uh, at the uh, at RBC, and uh, Shan graduated in uh, 2010 from uh, the PhD. Uh, Derek, next, is the director for Conver conversion and retention at Vmac Media. That's a full service e-commerce agency that works with retailers to build and grow their online stores. Uh, prior to joining DMAC Media, direct her positions at London Economics International as a consulting firm, and we had the, the president here last uh, last week talking to, to you, all of you guys. Uh, he worked also at Chopper's Dragon in business analytics, as well as Cypress Semiconductors as an economics and pricing strategies. Next, we have Krishna, Krishna Patel. Uh, Krishna is uh, class of 2012, she has an MA and a BA from Waterloo. Uh, Krishna works in the advisory service practice at Ernst & Young LLP. She has experience in sales, procurement, business, and data analysis, change management, and development of sector strategies in the IT, retail, and automotive, automotive industries. Prior to joining Ernst & Young, Krishna served the Ontario, at the Ontario provincial government in gathering data on how other jurisdictions compete for job creations as well as developing sector strategies for the information, communication, and technology sector. Uh, next, we have Rob Nicholson. <coughs> Rob uh, began his career with the Ministry of Finance as an economist in the Office of the Budget and Taxation. He then joined uh, the Office of Economic Policy as a special policy advisor and executive assistant to the chief economist and assistant deputy minister, followed by a year as the manager of the strategic uh, policy unit in the Ministry of Infrastructure. Rob returned to the Office of Economic Policy in February 2013, 
as manager of the current analysis unit. Uh, then we have Sarah, Sarah Fong, who is uh, MA 2005. Sarah Fong is the sole founder of the real estate startup Sweet City, an online marketplace for private condo sales that helps condo buyers and sellers manage the process of sales themselves, saving both time and money. Sarah graduated from the University of Waterloo's Master's of Economics program. She then went to work at Deloitte as an economic analyst, analyst sorry, in the international division and then as a senior market analyst with Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. After nearly a decade of working in the private and public sectors, she left with the dream of starting her own business. A business idea was formalized when she put pen to paper and applied for the CYBF Spin Master Innovation Fund. After pitching her business idea, she became one of six successful recipients in 2013 and received $50,000 in startup funding. Next we have Terence, Wake Up Song. Uh, with Ping Yong and Yong here, 2013, class of 2013. So, before starting his MA, Weka worked at Citibank in China as a risk analyst intern, and after graduating with his MA in 2013, Weka was offered a job as a risk analyst at TV Securities. In September, he accepted the position as senior risk analyst with TV Securities as well. And last but not least, we are the youngest of the cohort, uh, Andrew. Uh, Still needs to graduate, um, <laughs> hoping he will. <laughs> he is still an MA candidate, and uh, Andrew did his BA in math here at, at Waterloo. I think I've had Andrew in four or five of my classes. I think so. Yeah. So he's a, a tech product manager uh, at Zynga, who's a mobile game space uh, uh, firm, and you probably have played some of his games, especially Farm Bill. And, um, the, uh, I guess Andrew will tell us a bit more about what he does. Okay, so what I would uh, invite you to do is maybe tell, you have to take five minutes, a couple of minutes, and tell, tell us a bit more about sort of what you do. And uh, uh, I'm going to divide the group into uh, sort of two. I'm going to take Krishna, Terence, and, and Andrew, since you guys uh, just graduated. And uh, if you can talk more about your first job experience, uh, co-op, if you've done co-op, um, and sort of uh, the progression from, from there. And then I'm going to take the other group, uh, Derek, you're sort of in the middle, sorry. I'm going to take Derek, uh, Sean, Rob, and Sarah. And you guys can talk more about your progression, uh, your career. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Sean, maybe, uh, if you want. And to tell us a little bit about what you do, your progression as, as uh, your new career, and what sort of things that, that help you along the way, and things that sort of that you took from here that, that were very useful in your career. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to come back again after uh, like four years. Like the last time I came here was. Uh, uh, in the uh, year uh, 2010, uh, you know, I'm at a convocation. So it's been uh, four years, it's been a long time. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for inviting me. Like, you know, this is a very good uh, event. I hope I had, I had such kind of event when I was in school. <laughs> so um, so I, I uh, joined, uh, um, I started my PhD uh, at University of Waterloo uh, in 2005. Yeah, 2005. At that, at that time, I wanted to, um, you know, to uh, um, work in the um, private sector. At that time, so um, um, I'm very interested in the finance. So um, uh, I, um, I asked the professor uh, uh, Margaret uh, Insley like to be my supervisor because he's doing um, a reaction stuff. So which I'm very interested. So I just asked her like what I can, you know, do the research with her. Like she's very happy to, you know. To, to guide me and uh, you know, to teach me all, all those uh, you know um, uh, stuff so it's very helpful um, uh, for me to gain um, more um, knowledge on the finance and uh, some uh, uh, theory and also the coding stuff are very important so um, I, I found my uh, I did my co-op in uh, 2009 
uh, at the Ontario Financial Authority in the uh, Investor Relations Group. Uh, actually, to to uh, to find a co-op as a PhD is very it's very uh, difficult because you know many people thought that you you were um, overqualified for the job that they posted. So it's very uh, competitive for me to get a job. But um, luckily, I had the opportunity to get into that organization. Even though you know the the stuff that I do I did was um, you know just uh, to prepare some slides for the roadshow you know to promote the entire uh, bomb. Uh, the government bond and to do some research about you know investors um, so those are you know not very uh, complicated things but it uh, it was a very good opportunity for me you know to know the people in the in the organization so that's very important like you know um, later on like uh, they had an opening in the risk control department so I had I, I had opportunity to uh, to be interviewed and then I got a I got a I got a, a job offer because they because one of the important things is to get to know the people. So I, I started to work as a risk uh, control analyst uh, the same year, uh, 2009, for seven, seven months. And then like, uh, I landed my, um, uh, my full-time job like, uh, at RBC as a, a senior, risk, uh, a senior risk analyst uh, in, the, in the validation team. So the uh, it, it was not easy for me to find a full-time job, you know, um, to be honest, as a PhD student at that time. Uh, the only place probably in that bank to accept a PhD student is probably the, um, the, uh, the quant risk management team, uh, the quant team in the risk management, and uh, as well as the front office quant team. So you, um, I'm very lucky to know the people you know, who is in the, at the RBC and who has the connection with the, with the quant group. So I sent him my resume and then he forwarded my resume to the VP. And the VP is, uh, you know, he, um, he gave me the chance to, to I had an inter interview in that group. And then like, I, um, they like me and then I got a job. So the, the lesson that I learned is that you need to know the people networking is very important. And then after that, you know, you, you get, only you have the opportunity, you know, to show your skills, uh, your techniques, and your personality. So um, one lesson that I, I, I can share is to you know to to know more people in the industry. That's the, probably the one of the best way to get an interview. And then the following is that you know uh, it's it's um, it's your um, your knowledge and your technique, all this stuff. So, and uh, I have been uh, study. Uh, sorry, I, I work in the uh, validation group for two years, and then like I was given the opportunity to to uh, oh, uh, in the validation group I was doing the uh, banking book um, uh, uh, credit risk parameter validation. So um, that's. Um, that's for two years, and then like I was given the opportunity to work as a uh, manager in the in the to do the trading book credit risk uh, vetting and validation, which is um, uh, it's it's still credit uh, credit uh, risk model, but it's in a trading book side. So uh, the techniques that I, I I use every day, you know, during the work is. Um, you know, I need to uh, do the research, and because we, we, we are responsible for vetting and validating all the pricing models as well as the risk uh, risk model. So we need to do the research and to, to read the papers and uh, also to coding. So the software that I use during the work is, um, you know, a MATLAB for the banking books and credit risk validation, like MATLAB, SAS, and uh, VBA are very, very important, you know, when you do the work. So the coding, uh, I spent probably 50% 50, 50 of my time coding, and then like 30% of time probably reading, and then like, you know, the, the rest is to communicating with different, you know, counterparties about the, the model related issue and all this stuff. So um, another, another lesson, another, another thing that I can share is that, you know, the coding is very important, so, so my lab is for so <laughs> trying to learn it, <laughs> master it. So yeah, that's 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 what I can share right now. Sarah, maybe you can do next. Talk a little bit about your experience and your career growth, and especially why you switched from being 
<laughs> Roy, I think I'll be Roy. Um, okay, so I actually started my I started my career at Deloitte. I, I applied for um, for jobs at the very beginning of the Masters and all the recruiting events were happening in September and I was hired on um, to join Deloitte in October of the year I started my Masters for the following year. Um, and I, I joined the under I guess an international national tax department at Deloitte as an economic analyst consultant. Um, and I was there for a couple of years and it was a great, great training ground for um, for your career. They, they, you work really long hours, you work really hard, and uh, you get a, you gain a diversity of skills from um, uh, you know, being able to do uh, you know, a lot of Excel work, a lot of analytics, a lot of report writing, um, communicating with um, you know top line like CEOs, executives. Um, you know, it's a consulting job, and uh, and they really help you progress through your career at Deloitte as well um, into the higher levels to get promoted. And I actually decided to leave because I wanted to go back and do more economic analysis work. Because I was, it was a little bit of economic analysis in the consulting world, but it was mostly consulting. Um, so I, I applied for Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, CMHC, which is a crown corporation, the housing agency of the federal government. And uh, I, it was a job that interested me because it wasn't just economic analysis. It was a lot of um, presentations as well. It was a lot of, um, you know, working with the media, a lot of report writing, a lot of um, uh, networking with people in the housing industry and helping um, uh, municipalities develop their housing policies and just a very um, multifaceted job. And uh, I got in there and stayed there for five years. Um, and through that time, I've been promoted up to the senior market analyst level. And then I was thinking about, well, what I want to do next. Because I've done that for about five years, and it was about time, and I learned the job very well. Um, and I felt ready to move on. And I wanted to move on within the within CMHC, but um, the opportunities at the federal level in Toronto are quite limited. You pretty much have to go to Ottawa if you want to progress at the federal level. Um, and so that was something that I had to think about, you know, do I want to go A, go to Ottawa, or do I want to stay in pretty much the same level for a while before I can get promoted to the next level. Um, I decided I didn't want to do that. I was ready to start, try something else. and. Um, and I done and while I was at CMHC, I had always taken a lot of the different courses that they offered. I networked with a lot of different people. They knew that I wanted to get promoted. They knew that um, I was always pushing for more. And they actually started a leadership program when I was there for a lot of the young people to help develop their careers while they're sort of waiting to get promoted. And I was accepted into this program, and we had to do a lot of different projects and activities, and a lot of these activities are recognized at the national level, and it was it was a really great opportunity, especially being in the government. I don't think a lot of agencies have opportunities like that, um, but uh, I, I still wanted to move on in my job and, and try something different, and I knew if I stayed there, it would be a long wait to get up there, so I decided to leave and uh, start something on my own, and so um, I, I did, and uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do when I left. Um, but I knew I was going to be able to do something. If I, if I was able to do projects that were recognized at the national level uh, for the federal government, I figured that, you know what, I can probably start something on my own and try it out for a bit. And if it doesn't work out, I'll always go back to a job. Um, so I, I left and I applied for um, the SPIN Master Program as part of the um, Canadian Youth Business Foundation, which is now called Futurepreneur. So they, they encourage a lot of young entrepreneurs uh, to start businesses and they offer startup uh, funding to do that. And uh, the Spin Master program requires you to put together a business plan and uh, pitch your business to an executive team that included people from uh, from Futurepreneur, from Spin Master, from Chorus, a couple of different um, large companies, and they would then decide whether or not to accept you into the program. So I was selected in 2013 to start the, to, to be one of the recipients of the funding to, to uh, start my business fund. They offer a lot of mentorship. They still offer a lot of mentorship and a lot of opportunities to uh, network and build the connections that I need within the industry um, or other you know, um, supports like uh, technical supports or um, media and marketing help uh, to help build the profile for your business. And I'm still working at it now and still trying to, you know, 
make something of it, but um, it, it's been a learning experience. It's totally different than working in the private sector, totally different than working in the public sector. I think my career, career progression has probably kind of been a little different than some others um, that have graduated from, uh, from economics, but um, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a great, um, for me, a great journey. And I think you know, when Chan said about networking, I think that was, that's probably one of the biggest, most important skills that you can develop throughout your career, that's something you have to start right from the beginning, is all those, um, you know, the networking and you know, communication and being able to, um, yeah, to be able to, to, to meet different people and 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 because you, you never know where those opportunities may lead you, um, yeah, wherever you go in your career, and to stay connected with people as well. I mean, Professor Senna and in, 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 like we stayed in touch for the last ten years, <laughs> and uh, there's been times where he's asked, you know, do you, do you know anybody that um, in your apartment may be hiring for for students or. Uh, and I've asked him as well, do you have any students that are interested in, in working here? And so there's been um, lots of opportunities that have come out of the, uh, from networking in, in all of the uh, positions that I've held. So I think that's one of the, uh, the big um, uh, skills that you can develop as well as taking every opportunity you can everywhere you work. So taking all the courses that they offer at the different companies, um, taking the opportunities to meet people at different social events, meet people in different departments, uh, and you never know where those opportunities can lead you. Thank you, Sam. Rob, next. Thanks. It's nice to be back uh, in Waterloo after it's hard to believe it's been 10 years since I graduated here. So it's uh, yeah, 10 years ago I was sitting in your shoes. And uh, um, my first job uh, uh, was in the co op program. I uh, was the, the provincial government and the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade. Um, it was like an eight month uh, co op, which was great. And uh, I learned a lot during that time, I learned a lot how government works. And, and, uh, I networked a lot, so I, you'll, I think that's probably going to be a recurring theme here today. Is networking like crazy? Um, so, so that's what I did. So I made the most of my um, my opportunity there, and then um, so then I graduated, and uh, within a couple months, um, I got an interview at the uh, Ministry of Finance in Toronto, uh, which is where I've been since. And um, but I think having that co-op experience. Um, with the government before it definitely helped get my foot in the door. Um, so my first job was, uh, was in the division called the Office of Budget and Taxation. Um, so the division is responsible for taxation policy uh, for the province and producing the provincial budget, which is the biggest thing that the Ministry of Finance does in a year. Um, so I, by, by no means was I a, a taxation policy expert. Um, when I got in. It was an entry-level economist position, but um, I had shown some, uh, they liked what they saw, what I did in my co-op experience, and I think they saw in me that I could, you know, you could learn quickly. And uh, so, so that was my first, uh, my first job. And uh, so I stayed in that unit for, um, for a couple of years. Um, and uh, um, I worked hard, I learned quickly. Um, asked a lot of questions too, that's the other thing. Don't pretend uh, that you know everything. Um, so learn from the people around you, you know, the senior economists, et cetera, uh, or, or your manager. Um, and uh, again, ask a lot of questions. And uh, so I did that and um, I wasn't the type of person that just I did my work and shut the door. Um, my door was always open and, and uh, I was always talking to other people. I was trying to figure out how government works and how the ministry works and where to, I was always trying to plan my next step. Um, so I stayed there for a couple of years and I was promoted actually within the unit and I think you do that through hard work. Um, and I was always kind of the person that went above and beyond, right? I mean, uh, so don't just do what you're asked. Always try to go one step above. Um, be proactive um, and take initiative. Um, so managers definitely like that and that's how you kind of get recognized. So, um, so if they needed a a, a person to sit on the retreat committee, I was doing that. If they need somebody to stay late and work on a note, I would do it. Um, if the assistant deputy minister's office needed a volunteer to fill in uh, as executive assistant, I would do it. Um, so that's kind of how I got noticed. And it kind of, um, so through a combination of that and like really hard work, um, I kind of advanced, uh, progressed within uh, that division. Um, so I, I, did, I got noticed by the assistant deputy minister at the time, and uh, I took on a unique role of kind of, um, so half my career I've been, been in kind of like research policy, kind of number crunching type roles, and the other half um, I've been in management leadership type roles. Um, but so, so I caught the attention of the assistant deputy minister at the time, and I was asked to uh, do a one-year kind of secondment um, from the job that I was in uh, as uh, the coordinator for the provincial budget and fall economic statement and public account. So that was a really, really cool opportunity. It's, uh, it's one person does it every year, um, and it's a real uh, learning experience. 
Um, you're working with all different divisions. You're getting involved in all kinds of different issues. You're managing uh, multiple issues, people. Uh, it's it was something else. So that was an amazing experience. Probably one of the best of my career. Um, and then from there, I went. Um, I was determined to get into the Office of Economic Policy, which is a, a big division within finance. And uh, I used that opportunity to get um, a, a role. It's called Special Policy Advisor and Executive Assistant to the um, Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Economist for the province. So um, I thought that would be a great move for my career to kind of learn uh, from the Chief Economist. Uh, essentially, what you do is you manage the office. You, it's a leadership role. Um, you have uh, people reporting to you. You manage all the flow uh, of work going through the division. Um, and uh, you're the lead policy advisor to the uh, ADM and Chief Economist. So, so I did that actually for um, I think two and a half years. Uh, and uh, again, one of the best experiences of my career, in, that, in addition to the other one. Um, uh, so uh, a great opportunity. Again, I learned from you know, uh, the Chief Economist and you're providing advice. Uh, and that's something you'll be doing all your career. Uh, and so from there, I left. I went to uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure. Um, I got a manager position over there, uh, in, called the Strategic Policy Unit. Um, and by no means was I uh, an expert in infrastructure policy, but I think the progression that I demonstrated throughout my career, um, you know, that I, I could give good advice. I can. I know what people are looking for um, uh, in a briefing note uh, and in a slide deck. Um, uh, those kind of things definitely uh, helped me get that job. Uh, so I did that for about a year, and then I came back to the Office of Economic Policy uh, to the position that I'm currently at um, as manager of the current analysis unit. Um, it's basically an economics uh, shop um, where the um, we report on the economy, uh, state of the economy for the government. Um, we hold all the economic data uh, the government uses. We produce the Ontario Economic Counts, uh, which uh, shows how the economy is performing uh, in, a, in a quarter. That's all kind of done in-house within my group. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. Again, I manage a team of about six economists. We um, hire a co-op student uh, every term from the University of Waterloo. Um, and uh, we also have a programming student to kind of help us with our data needs. Every day we're constantly downloading data. Uh, and so we have a programming student as well that helps out with that. So um, so that, that's where I'm at in my career. Um, and, uh, and again, I think we'll address a lot of the questions. We all, I'm sure you have a lot of questions for me, so I can definitely um, help answer some of those afterwards. Thank you, Rock. Good. Uh, thanks. Unlike uh, most of the guys and girls who have talked so far, I kind of had a non-traditional route. I don't do economics as, a, as my profession. Um, when I finished my undergrad, I, I, I did uh, co-op throughout undergrad, uh, and I'd always worked at in, in energy. So I worked at Ontario Power, the ISO. Uh, so when I graduated, I worked for Direct Energy um, out in Calgary, managing their, their retail uh, book, basically energy trading. Um, but I, I realized that in order to have a future in that, it would have to be in Calgary or in Houston. Um, and, and to me, the location of where I was working would be important. Uh, so I came back, I went to grad school. Uh, and following grad school, I moved out to California because I knew I wanted to be in tech. Uh, I got a job at a semiconductor company called Cypress Semiconductors. Uh, they make chips that go into your phones and computers. Uh, and I was a pricing strategist there, um, which was great. It was a great introduction to to tech and it actually, the last time I was back in Waterloo was as a recruiter on behalf of Cyprus, so um, it was, that was a lot of fun. But uh, I, knew, I, I knew I wanted to be in retail and that's something that, that had always interested me. Um, so I, I actually got a job at Shoppers Drug Mart in their analytics department, so they have a wealth of data. Like they, the Optimum program has over 10 million participants. They track you for decades. They have everything you buy, uh, the promotions you respond to. So like it's a it's a crazy data set to work with. Um, so I was working in their personalization, so doing uh, targeted marketing, um, and, and it's kind of ties back to economics. But how do you get how do you incent someone to buy something? Uh, what's the right channel? What's the right offer? Um, is it points? Is it a discount? So that's that's kind of the the models that we were working with at Shoppers. Uh, and then I got an opportunity to move over to DMAC Media recently, which is uh, as as Professor S J P said. Um, an e-commerce agency. So we, we build and grow websites. Uh, so I'm in the process of building out our consulting practice, which is uh, conversion optimization. We go in and we help retailers identify testing opportunities uh, in terms of, you know, maybe it's your checkout can use work or your user experience can use work, but it's, it's data-driven insights to improve the user experience. Um, so that's where I'm at. It's, a, it's not really been a traditional economist role, but definitely uh, What's been helpful, as everyone else has sort of touched upon, is 
Uh, every step of the way, I've sort of reached out to people uh, that I thought were interesting or might, might provide relevant insight, and that's how I've sort of landed all these random jobs. Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's an important skill to have to put yourself out there and ask questions. Because um, you know, quite often people are willing to answer and help, uh, even with, with little to no incentive. Like on LinkedIn, it's a great resource to just reach out to people and, and ask the questions you need to ask. Uh, and I'm sure we'll address some of the other stuff as we go along. Thank you, Derek. Krishna? Okay. Um, so I was in your shoes very recently. Um, I was looking for a co-op, and I'm going to focus more on the co-op side of it because I know that's more relevant to you guys at this stage. Um, so I did my co-op at the Ministry of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. It's a mouthful. Um, but really looking at economic, economic development for IT companies. Um, and then I got a contract position there, which I did until end of December. And then I moved to Ernst & Young, which is where I am right now doing consulting. Um, so the reason, I'll start with the whole searching side of co-op. I highly recommend the networking. Like I said, Waterloo is great for that. We have networking events that run all of February to, I mean, January to February. So first thing I did was I got business cards. I We have a service for that. It's $5. You can get like 50 or something. Um, and I went to networking sessions. I gave up my business cards, like literally threw them in the air and I was like, please take them. Um, but it was also just learning more about what was out there. Um, it wasn't like, I didn't go into it thinking, no, I'm going to work at the government. That's all I want. I went into it like really curious to understand what, what do people do out there and how can I take the skills that I learned in my MA program and apply it, um, even not just MA so far because I did uh, co-op in my undergrad. Um, so networking was huge and then searching. So on job mine, I know there's filters to say, oh, just economics jobs. Don't limit yourself. Like I, the Ministry of Economic Development actually only hired masters of public policy and um, I applied to it. I got an interview. Everyone else was in a master's of public policy, but I still got the job at the end of the day. So don't let that stop you at all. Um, and then interview tips, I would say prepare all the time. I mean, I got asked questions of like, I don't know, uh, brain teasers, you know, a monk goes up a hill and the beginning of the day comes back. Like you'll be thrown so much, but if you're prepared to at least like know how to solution something, which is what the profs here will teach you. Like, there's no prof at this university that I've gone to and that they just directly gave me an answer. They walked me through it. Like, okay, what do you think? Okay, so what about this? What about that? So really use that skill when you're answering questions. Um, even when you're, when you have your job, like, you'll, you'll never have a solution that's clean cut and you have to go find that solution. So use the skills that your profs are kind of teaching you secretly that you don't realize. I mean, sometimes you're like, oh my God, just tell me the answer. I don't really care how you got to it. But now when you're in the workforce, you're like, okay, I know why, because you know what? There's no solution that's clean cut out there. So that's something that I definitely learned along the way. Um, and then curiosity, like you mentioned, I love that drive, your job search. Even when you're at your job, don't stop with, oh, I just have this to do, so that's all I'm going to do. Um, a good example is when I worked at the ministry, um, they, so they give money to corporations for, okay, X number of jobs, we're going to give you this much. And I was like, what constitutes a good deal? Like, how does the government decide, like, this is the amount of money I'm going to give and this is the company I'm going to give it to? So that was something that was... Um, you know, driving me crazy. I was like, I don't get it. This is public money. You're just giving it away. So I started doing research on that. And actually, the next co-op that took up um, over my position, which is TJ, who's also an MA student here, he actually continued that. So that's actually something they're working on is how to constitute what's a good deal. So let stuff like that drive you. And don't stop at like, oh, I just need you to do this briefing. No, go over and beyond. Thank you, um, hi everyone, um, I'm glad to be here and thank you much for saying for inviting me here. Uh, I was in the same class with Christian and uh, I was in the club stream and I found a job, I got an offer, but finally it was cancelled. So it's a really bad year for me uh, when I was graduating. I was like struggling, maybe you can feel right now, maybe you, feel, you can feel after a few months. Uh, I spent uh, a lot of time on 
networking after I graduate. Like Shen mentioned, like it's extremely important. You have to know the people. You have to know what they did, and then, then you can be well prepared for the job or well prepared for what you're going to do in the future. So uh, for me, after I graduate, I I applied all the jobs as much as possible. But the thing is, it, it doesn't work out since my based on my background, since I I don't really have many corporate experiences as as Christian or as others. So. For me, it's like a blank paper to the employers. Like especially for me, I want to get into the uh, bank industry. So I network with that, like all the people as much as possible, and I realized that the quality of industry, as Shane mentioned, that's the most uh, fit industry for us. I would say, like for me at least, um, I realized that's a good opportunity and it's a good industry for me, and I started working on that applications in those industries, like risk management jobs. So since then, I, I received a few interviews. It, some works, but some not, and some were canceled for no reason. So, but I didn't give up. Uh, like in November 2013, actually, yeah, I was interviewed at TG Securities, and finally I got the offer. And ever since then, I was working with all the credit risk models like Shen, it's, it's quite similar and we, we also working on credit risk parameters like PD, LGD, maybe you're quite familiar with. And uh, we're also working on commercial, uh, commercial portfolio stress testing models which is quite familiar, uh, quite popular for now for the bank, whole banking industry. And I, I believe all the risk management teams in all the five banks are expanding for now since they have all strong regulations in Canada and in the US. So, it's a big opportunity for students who is willing to get into the quantitative industry and also from an office quants as Shan mentioned. And uh, yeah, luckily I, I was promoted to uh, senior analyst in September because of hard work and you have to go beyond everything you're working on, like Rob mentioned. It's quite important. You, you can't just like do whatever the manager wants you to do, but you have to work beyond that. You have to know how your department how your department works and how the bank works. Like, what's your team's role in the whole bank and how would you improve your work and stuff and so on. So yeah, it's quite been a good experience for me, like for up until now. So I am keep looking forward to um, be, uh, still working for a few more years in the industry. So maybe in the future I may get more networking and jump into another industry like consulting, I don't know, so <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. So I'm going to start a little earlier in my story just to give you an understanding of how valuable the MA program is. So I started my undergrad in 09, right? Um, it was in not the program I finished in, but the point is, so Start out, I took a course with Larry Smith, don't know if you guys know him. He's an econ, econ prop here, he's great. Fell in love with that, the course, not the guy. Um, <laughs> after that, I took courses with Lamb and Macro and Sen and a slew of things and more Macro with Lamb. And I really started to fall in love with the department, not just the courses. Right? These guys think a lot of us and they, they take the time to prep us for the real world. So. My grades kind of sucked, but um, Sen was willing to give me a chance in the MA program, and these guys really cultivate you professionally, so I really thrived. Um, not just technically, which of course everyone here has noted that the technical skills you get here are through the roof, but just things that like how everyone in the program was working together, right? Teamwork. I mean, I did my undergrad in math, and for the most part, like you sit there on your own in the dark and do the math on your own. But when I did this MA, everyone was working together. I really got my first chance at true teamwork with people at the same skill level, right? So that's a huge soft skill that, you, that I learned. Um, on top of that, these guys took out time in their days to help us actually get um, like do well in interviews instead of just standing around awkwardly and not knowing what to talk about. Like Sen fully like he booked, he let us book time. We all had to like dress up for it, even though it was not a real interview. But that was a big part of it, right? And like 
it wasn't like doing a mock interview with your mom, where she's like, great job, right? <laughs> like, so I sat down, I told him what I thought, and he's like, that sucks, you're not selling yourself as an economist. Which, it's hard to give someone that, right? It's hard to tell someone the truth, but these profs are willing to do it, and that's extremely valuable. So, with that in mind, I went into interviews. A lot of them went poorly, but some of them went well. Um, from there, a big piece of advice I can give for like just job mine interviews and MA interviews that you're gonna do now is like be yourself. Don't just like agree to everything they say. Don't just like just accept anything they say. Pretend you're interested in everything that they're talking about. Admit what you're interested in, show what like you're passionate about so that they can understand where you can fit in the organization. That's a really big point when you're doing these interviews that hopefully you guys are gonna have a lot of soon. Um, so that's the logic I went in with, the experience, the practice interview experience I went in with, and I got a product management co-op at Zynga, which makes Farmville everyone's favorite game, and um, Words with Friends, and a whole bunch of others. So unlike these guys, I didn't have much of a network. But one thing not to forget is these props are huge networks, right? Like, like, I always thought I don't have a network, but you have to remember that you do, right? These guys are there to help you, and just like anyone else, I would be in a network. So that's a big point. And in any case, um, so I got that position. I got it because in my interview, I was just true to myself, right? That, that interview, I was telling these guys, um, I actually ended up arguing with the, with the manager because I disagreed with something he said about like the direction that the market's going in. And we just like debated for like half an hour and then I left and then I got the job. <laughs> so, for the third time for yourself. Um, so from there, just to quickly get into what I do, because I'm obviously not that old of an alumni. I not finished yet, right? So I'm a product manager at Zynga. It's a tech company, so it's got all that tech vibe and the, um, surrounded by software engineers every day. Um, it's so a big thing about it is it's obviously not traditional economics, right? Like I'm the only one in there with an econ degree besides the CEO. Um, which is a huge advantage because in tech, the people in that industry have like this like innate hate for like MBAs and business people, but they love economists for whatever reason. <laughs> like they give us the jobs that other industries would normally give to an MBA because they think we're like the numbery version of those guys, right? So hey man, this is good advice. <laughs> um, so if you position yourself like that as a business person who has their technical chops down, right? Understands what these numbers are, like doesn't want to just leave the room when the engineers start talking, they'll love you. They'll they'll think like you are the biggest opportunity for them more than the other way around. Um, so that's the that's the kind of profile I've been building for myself within this company. Um, as for what I do, if you guys are super like curious, um, in product management, we we work with a portfolio of games. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's games for any other product. And so, in my position, uh, I was describing this earlier. Um, engineers have more say than ever before. So, once upon a time, in tech companies. Um, a bunch of managers would sit in a room, chat with each other, and then just come out and be like, just shower the engineers with work to do, right? So that's no longer the case. Engineers are taken much more seriously, right? Their opinions matter. They, they go into the meetings. They're part of specking up features and things like that. So as a product manager, you don't just come up with ideas and say, you guys have to do this now, right? Now, the, where the market is, you have to go in and say, this is, the, this is what we need to do to, for example, the shop within, the, within our product, right? We need to reorganize this and we need to redesign it this way. These are the numbers as to why this makes sense. 
This is, these are the competitors who are doing it right, these are the competitors who are doing it wrong. You have to explain to your engineers why what you're doing makes sense. So that's a huge part of my position. That involves a huge amount of data crunching. I mean, I'm in a very, like, it sounds qualitative position, but I spend a lot of time on SQL crunching numbers through the tracking data of all our users. I'm spending time using R, which is to do analysis on all, the, all that data. It's huge amounts of data, like millions and millions of rows of data. And then I'm even doing Python prototyping like features, like really ugly versions of features that to convince everyone in the team that this is the direction we need to go in. So my position is super collaborative, which going back to the MA program, being always working together and doing that teamwork was super valuable. So it, I mean, I've only worked for like six months, but it's all come full circle and has this program has been super valuable to me. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I think one theme that's coming out is networking, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing events like that. Uh, we haven't done many of these for previous cohorts. I think I don't think we've seen events like that when we were around. Uh, hopefully, you are taking advantage of these events, and we will have more of these very likely next time as well. Um, what I'm going to do is open the floor for, for questions. Uh, you can direct your questions to anyone you want, or you can ask your general questions, and uh, feel free to, to step in if you can, if you can uh, add anything. Actually, so, before we do that, can we ask some questions? And then yes. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just I don't want to spend the rest of the one and a half hours here. But so here's kind of my uh, question. Um, in terms, uh, and please be candid, right? So in terms of the skills that you learn from our courses, and I'd like to hear everybody's response to this. Uh, what are the skills which uh, you learned that you think are useful? You can talk in broadly, but even you can narrow it down in terms of the courses and what we taught. That that's fine. And what are the things which we didn't teach? but you think we can somehow imbibe in our courses or we can offer to you. So, I don't know, Shan, you want to start? Okay, uh, the techniques that I learned from, you know, doing my PhD is definitely, you know, helpful for doing, you know, the quality of that job that I'm doing right now. So, uh, I need to code uh, as well as read some papers. And the most important thing is, you know, is the in order to succeed, what you do right now is like I think economics background really helps me, you know, to understand all the numbers. You know, in the end, like you know, you need to identify okay this number and what's wrong with this number and uh, you know why this trend you know like this. So I think economics theory like you know all have prepared me for have a better business sense. You know, in order to interpret all the numbers to the senior management. You know, how to present all your results is very important. And uh, all the business sense, you know. Uh, many people have the te strong technical skills, but not many people have you know, uh, some business sense, common sense, that for you to, to, interpret, to interpret your results. I think that's very important you know, to have an you know, economics background, so, and also you know, the, the, the coding and all the, um, the, the theory that we learn are very helpful. So. And the, the way to think, you know, um, uh, in order to solve the problem, and uh, you need to um, do your own research and uh, um, like independent thinking is very important. You know the technique that, that I learned by doing my um, you know uh, PhD uh, here. So you cannot uh, rely on other people. You know to solve the problems, you need to solve by yourself. That's the kind of person that manager likes, right? So manager has their own things to do, and you need to figure out your problem, and you you need to uh, it's better for you to give them the solution. Then they will help. They will like that kind of person. They don't like the person that you know who f only find a problem, not a solution. So the independent thinking and all those, and the, uh, also the time management skills and communication skills are very important. So that's what I can think of. Uh, so despite not being in finance or having a very economic-y job, um, you actually find applications for the things you learn in courses everywhere. So like as a, as a practical example, at Shoppers, um, you can imagine they have thousands of promotions out in market at any given time. They have flyers, they have radio ads, they have newspapers, whatever. Um, how do you parse out the effect of cutting newspaper? Like how do you understand that? Well, manager math is like, 
you know, let's look at an area that does have a fire and then one that doesn't and take the difference, right? But you know as an economist that there are other confounding effects that are going on. So, so having the insight to like, and it's very rudimentary stuff from an economics, from a true economist standard standpoint, but to non-technical people, it's, it's hugely valuable to, to be able to give that insight and say, well, like, listen, there are other things that are going on and let's try and under, to capture those, to isolate out the effect of something. But even in terms of like, um, like discounting, you'd think that the concept of like price elasticities is something that would be you know common knowledge, but it really isn't, right? This idea of developing a, a database of price, elas price elasticities for products is novel to even large retailers, right? So, so discounting happens at, essentially at random by some product manager or, or, or whoever. Um, they, they will they pick these these price targets and they, it's random, but having the being able to get insight from that and then make better decisions going forward is, is something that, a skill set that you learn, I guess, through coursework. But, um, but yeah, in terms of soft skills, like collaboration is a big one. That's the, a big difference I found going from undergrad to master's is, is our MA class is very close knit. Um, everyone works together. Um, so just leveraging that, that network and, and being able to bring that to the workforce is, is, is important. Um, so I learned from JP, uh, his class is modeling, really like price velocity. So we had a client that wanted us to take a set of their sample data for their commercial banking and create a, a price velocity model. So that was applied. So those kind of technical skills. But again, I'm going to go back to the fact that um, the ability to get come to a conclusion and analyze and interpret, that's something that's very key that we learn in this MA program. Um, and also how quickly you have to learn MATLAB and then STATA and all these different programs. It's not really about the program, it's that ability to be on a learning curve and really learn it and pick up on it quick. And so the other thing uh, to your second part of your question what we don't learn in an MA program is really building a brand for yourself. You don't realize that you have all these skills. So before you even go into this job searching, I highly recommend just self-reflect, see what can I do, what have I learned, and how can I use this to provide value to the employer. So I think that's something that we don't really learn because we get so fussed up about, oh my god, there's an error in my MATLAB code, how am I going to fix it? But think about like the fact that you can work through it and find a solution that shows that you have problem solving skills. So kind of look at the soft skills that you're learning in this program as well to build a brand to go into an interview with and say this is who you are. Yeah, I think everyone um, with a master's degree in economics will have a really, from Waterloo, you'll have a very um, solid background in economic theory and strong technical skills. Um, so definitely, we look for that. Employers will definitely value that. Again, you're, you'll hear about soft skills, and I mean uh, things like teamwork. Can you work well with the team? Right. When I'm building a team, when I'm hiring, well, when I look at that person. Will they fit well with the rest of the team? Will they add to the team dynamic, or will they actually take away from it? Um, are they going to make a strong, positive contribution in that sense? Um, I can't stress enough. Writing skills are so so important. Um, so on a, an industry finance interview, you'll be tested on your writing skills. Can you uh, write concisely, clearly? Um, and one of the challenges with economics is a lot of times you're dealing with very technical, kind of complicated subjects. Can you present that in a way? that's clear um, and that's understandable to a wide uh, audience. Um, so that's really, really important um, is the writing skills. Um, and I see it, I mean, when I screen resumes, I see, uh, I see resumes that have either spelling mistakes or that are um, um, just a little bit all over the place. So really focus in, in your classes on, on writing skills and writing. I mean, that's what we do all the time is you're writing briefing notes or you're writing, uh, and again, slide decks too as well too. How do you present information, the most important information? How do you get information across in as few words possible? Um, again, when, you're, when you work in the Ontario Public Service, I mean, your work is going to very senior decision makers and they don't have a lot of time to look at your work. Um, so try to get to your point, um, provide all the context and sort of get to the point as quickly as possible. I think uh, that's really important. Um, again, just being able to communicate. I mean, communication skills are uh, very, very important. Um, and you'll be in meetings at all, at all times during your career, um, and it's important that you're able to express your ideas. Um, uh, so, so that's very important. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, again, in general, those are things you look for. And uh, in an interview with the Ministry of Finance, that you'll be tested on all of those. Can you um, prepare a slide deck and can you present that? Can you uh, uh, interpret data and write a briefing note on it uh, and write it clearly and concisely and accurately? Um, those are things that are really, really important. I can't stress that enough. Sorry? Yeah, I think I'm echoing a lot of the um, things that have already been said, but the, the technical skills obviously are like great here. Um, I think for me, the things that I really remember and are able to take to the real world or the real world examples that we did in classes, we did a lot of those classes. I still remember all like the, the classes I took with Sam with all like the um, the real estate analysis. I don't know if you still do the housing market one. They obviously, is very relevant for my job. Um, we did you know talk about crime economics as well. Like there's so many real world examples um, that I can take and and take those examples as. Um, and apply them to the jobs I had because it's really important. Like data and it, you know, being able to analyze it's great, but then taking that information and being able to communicate what does it really mean, and not just what does it mean to you, but what does it mean to the audience that you're talking to. So it really depends on who your audience is. In your case, it's very you know the government level. You're talking to senior officials. In my case, when I was in government, I was talking to everybody in the real estate industry, from real estate agents to home builders to um, contractors, um, landlords, and they're all a different level of understanding of where the economy is at, and they all have different levels of interest. They all have um, different um, positions on the economy. So, and, and you being, being able to translate that information for all those different types of audiences, whether they are a, um, you know, their understanding of economics is up here or down here, um, you have to be able to communicate that in print, in, um, you know, in, in uh, oral communication. So I think that is a skill that um, I've learned throughout my career and, uh, I'm glad that I had the examples of you know looking at the data when I was in the MA and being able to um, talk about real world examples was great great um, learning opportunity. But I think that's something I would probably uh, say you know, it's something you could work on and, and um, really practice is taking that data and being able to communicate it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for me, I would, since I'm working in the quantitative industry as Chen did, but like the thing is. For us, I have a lot of colleagues that are in PhD degrees. Mm -hmm. They have PhD in physics, PhD in stats, PhD in economics, or whatever. But the good thing is for us, we have strong quantitative economic series background, so which can provide us a more quantitative for the projects or for the team, more on the quantitative side. But for the quantitative side, the good thing is uh, we have a lot of econometric courses, which provides a strong solid background for programming or problem solving on those modeling. And the key thing for me is the two projects I did, one is for Professor Sen's class and one is for Professor Chu's class, the highest class, yeah. Uh, the two projects is really important for my interview and since like the high manager, she asked for all the uh, the final paper I wrote, and also the also all the uh, it's my lab, it's all the my lab codes I wrote. So basically, she go over everything and ask my logic and ask how you did it, how you solve it, and what's the rationale, and what's the, this, like our daily job is to check the model development document and and find the issues and do the testing. So it's quite simple as our project. So. Uh, I, what I did for uh, my grad degree. So uh, my suggestion would be if there will be more applied projects, that would be great for the future jobs for us in the quantitative industry. Okay. Yeah, so I'm in a peculiar situation because I work with video games, and we video games nowadays like they typically have coins or some form of currency. Users can like interact with each other using that currency, buy, sell, trade with each other. Sometimes they even have like interest rates and loans. And so, my macro courses have been weirdly valuable because. <laughs> 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 you never thought that many pays out to JP's I never thought. You never want to put money on that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this little bit is specific to the industry I'm in. But we have to make sure that like the economy doesn't crash because people do like bank runs and things. 
Um, so everything's like extremely on point with what we're learning in school. And on top of that, we get to experiment with it, right? Like what uh, he was saying was uh, we can do A-B testing, but we can also do A-B testing on an in-game economy, right? So you can take ideas in macro. Should this interest rate be higher right now? Let's, give it, let's make it higher for these 500 people. See if, I don't know, their bank accounts explode or something. Um, so like everything has all that theoretical macro. If you want to really start applying it, get into video games. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on, another side to that is obviously everyone here has been talking about the technical skills. The big thing is data in like mon modern industries. Um, it is very hard to get a position where you will do nothing with data, right? So. Obviously, a huge thing is understanding how to deal with it. Some of these companies have unbelievable amounts of data that they're pulling in, and they expect people like us to sift through it. So a big thing there is not only just be able to program and get the results, but more importantly to me and to the people who I've interacted with while working is you can't just go in a meeting and be like, I did my regression and the beta is seven, right? <laughs> like. No one will know what you're talking about. It's not that anyone doesn't know, like, can't learn it. It's just everyone's busy with their own things, right? Like, people don't have time to sit there with an econometrics textbook just to understand what you're saying in the meeting. It's on you to explain what your results mean. So that's actually something we have a little bit in the MA program, like interpretation of the quantitative side of things, right? So that you could really clearly state it on the qualitative side. But I would hope that that's deeply ingrained in every course in the future. Okay, so I guess kind of to summarize though is that uh, what distinguishes us are, are one aspect are quant skills to work with data, but it's just not the fact that we're data hacks. We can take the data and we can uh, interpret it and we can say, well, this is a big picture, right? That, that's kind of what really grants us as, as economists. And so the point is that you can do all the programming which you want, and you can crunch out your regression estimates, but if someone comes to you and says, well, what does it mean? And what does it mean for my bottom line? And you can't answer that, you're useless, right? That's, is, is that correct? And so the other thing is that, so you need that. You also need some of the languages which we don't teach in class, like you have to know Excel because a lot of, is that correct? Yes. A lot of firms don't, yeah, a lot of firms don't have the resources to invest in sophisticated statistical packages and you need to know VBA, right? That's hugely. But, but I guess you can learn this by yourself with your YouTube tutorials, and, yeah. right? So that's something which uh, you can do uh, anyway. And um, so you know, that, that was very uh, useful. Now, here's an idea, I'll, I'll stop now quickly, but kind of like the idea which I had, and you know, the good thing being an associate chair, I can do what I want with some limits, is that what I started last year with uh, Andrew's cohort is that I started mock, mock interviews, right? And I really put them through the grinder, and I figured it out. But I want to go a bit further than that, right? So what I'm interested in with JP uh, is on Friday mornings, um, for some of the some of the weeks of the next semester, is to get the MAs and organize them in groups, right? And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a sense of who hangs out with who, because I'm trying to get groups who hate each other, right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm successful because they seem to be getting along with each other, which really defeats my purpose. But the point being is that that's the real world, right? You have to work together in groups with people you may sometimes not like. But you have to pull together, you have to, this sounds familiar, and you have to work on a project, and then you have to summarize your findings in a slide deck. In, in your opinion, I'd like to each, ask each one of you, would that be a waste of time, or would that be useful? Because I think they can actually have that on their CV. Not that I work with people I hate, but we have this experience where uh, we are forced to work in groups, and in these real life uh, uh, situations, and produce deliverables. So, starting with Sean? Uh, I think that's uh, very useful, you know, like, so the most important thing, you know, uh, in, a, in a work, in a real uh, world is to communicate, right? You need to have the skills to 
uh, persuade people, you know, uh, to how to present your findings and uh, how to interpret it and how to explain the complicated things in a simple way that everybody can understand, right? Obviously, that's the very important things. And uh, usually, you know, like most of the time, but like, you know, the senior management don't have time to, you know, to, to know. They don't care about your details. Just show them, you know, the, the, mo the your most important things, you know, the most important numbers and uh, how will you explain that, those numbers to them. And uh, so use the language that they, they understand. So that's obviously very, yeah, I think that your idea is very, um, yeah, would be helpful, I think. If my idea sucks, please be honest. <laughs> yeah, honest, I like your insight, but there are Yeah, you can guide, I do, yeah, I think that's useful, like, you know, like, <laughs> it helps people to know, like, you know, uh, you can explain things and probably uh, people can judge, right? Like, whether it's useful or not useful, whether, you know, they understand or not understand, or it's not useful, I guess. I, I like the concept. The, the challenge I have is that, uh, similar to, like right now as I build out my team, mm -hmm. um, I will tend to hire around deficiencies that I have. Okay. So I, I think in your MA, you, you tend to cluster and someone will be good at macro and someone will be good at micro and someone will be good at theory. And like you, you work as a team collaboratively, but you all have to have a minimal understanding, but you're, you're gonna have people who are stronger at certain things. And I think as, as I start to build out my team, that's, that's how I would start to hire, is hire around my deficiencies. And, and um, so the, the challenge with randomizing and, and getting people that you hate is you're, you're forcing people who may have the same skill set to, mm. to overcome right. something. But, but that, that being said, there's, there's learnings to come from that. So, so it may force you to work together as a team more. Um, but I just, in terms of my experience, I find that uh, you miss out on some of the collaborative benefits that, that come from having people with complement, complementary skill sets rather than um, maybe the same skill set. So we can have two projects. One is they hate each other, one is they complement each other. Yes. Um, I think that's a really good idea. So when I decided to go into consulting, actually all of my, most of my job interviews, they give you like a case study. You're locked up in a room and you had to figure out a solution to it. I think that's a great way to start. You give the students a problem. They work together. They have X number of time because time management is a huge thing that you need to learn. And uh, they present it to you and simplify it because people get really carried away in putting everything on PowerPoint and that's a big uh, no-no for us in consulting at least and that's one of the first things we learned is like how do you create a PowerPoint and how do you get to the point because people will only listen to you for like the first <laughs> yeah, first couple of seconds so. <laughs> um, absolutely I think it's a great idea um, the reality is in the real world man, you're gonna be working with a lot of great people that you like and that are great team members, but you'll also be working with a lot of people who are very difficult, and you have to kind of overcome that. And so how, and how do you overcome that? I think that's your challenge. Um, uh, it's something I know, it's a, a conflict resolution. Uh, it's a key skill, uh, and uh, when you're put in those situations, what do you do? Do you, you, know, do you make the problem someone else's? Do you, you know, just go to your manager, or do you try to resolve it yourself? I mean, so you will. Um, you'll be working with a lot of great people in your career, but you'll also be working with some very difficult people as well, too. So, um, and you know, to be successful, you have to uh, overcome that and find solutions to it. So, uh, so being put in some of those difficult situations like that, I think, is a is a great thing. Or, uh, sir. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. You've definitely come across a lot of difficult people in your career and knowing how to handle this, those situations is really important. You work with different teams that you are thrown together and, and, and sometimes and you, know, you may not like the person and you may like some of them. I may remember one example from when I was working at CMHC and I was thrown in this leadership group and we did get thrown together in a project, kind of a randomized team. and. Um, I was fine with my team members, but two of them didn't like each other, and uh, they worked in the same department. One of them didn't like the other one, and both of them had come to me. I had to mediate the situation, figure out how to deal with that. I wasn't the leader of the group, but I naturally became it because I was neutral to the situation and had to solve this problem so that at the end of the day, we could present our project to the national team, and you have to figure out how you're going to do that with two people who hate each other. So um, I think, uh, yeah, learning to work with others, especially when you're an economist, it's a very much of a lone shark type of job where you sit there and do a lot of, in a lot of roles, where you sit there and do a lot of economic analysis and then you do your report. And there isn't always a lot of teamwork, but being able to work as a team together when that does happen, um, 
it's really, really important. And even working with people outside of the economics group, like sometimes you might get pulled into some other team with another department, and being able to work with other types of people is, uh, is, is really important. So I, I think it's a good idea. It's a great idea, I would say. For my experience, I, I was like recently doing a project on validation of the vendors model, which is from a US consulting company. And they have tons of statistical PhDs, and they are doing modeling stuff. And it's, it's, I mean, the model is just bad. And they deal with tons of data. They have tons of model embedded in the whole project. But I realize that like, every time we find issues, and they're just pushing back. So after that, it's, I, I don't want to tell too much details in the, in the, uh, in the process. It's, it's, it's involves a lot of other uh, stuff. But the thing is, dealing with people you don't like, or you have conflict in interest, it's, it's really a good experience for you, for the future jobs. Just like doing the interviews for, doing a few interviews of my experience, uh, I was asked a few questions like, how do you solve conflicts with your colleagues or with your classmates doing projects, and how would you solve it, how would you handle with that? Like this kind of situation, no questions would be, I would, I think it would be key to the results of the interview system. How would you handle those conflicts in the real job situations? And would you just go to your manager and say, oh, this guy's just bad, I don't like him. <laughs> He's like, keep pushing me, doing something. It's, yeah, it's really a good idea to have those things in the projects and you can work with people you don't like. And yeah, it works out, I think. Andrew? So, um, in the tech industry, we mostly work with developers and QA, quality analysts. Now, these two positions, um, they're meant to complement each other, right? Developers make code, quality analysts play with the product and make sure everything works. But that creates a really tough dynamic because for a quality analyst to do their job right, they have to find issues with code, right? So if you're in QA, you doing your job well means someone else doing their job poorly, right? <laughs> Same within development, right? These quality analysts can find any problems with my code, right? I'm so great, they're terrible. So every meeting you sit in, these guys probably want to strangle each other. Um, so that's a situation where people, I mean, everyone's super likable. It's just by the nature of their work, it's hard for everyone to get along without any tension, right? So it's not just an issue of like different personalities. It could be ingrained in the work you're doing that you're just gonna have trouble like that, tension like that. So I mean, my position as product management, I have to keep these guys focused on the primary goal, which is to make the best product possible. In school, the primary goal is to do the best report or whatever work you're trying to do possible, right? So if there is some form of innate clashing, getting like practice working on it is obviously extremely valuable. That said, um, at least when I was in the MA, I didn't think anyone like, hated each other or anything. So people being in like, different cliques and different groups was more of just these are the people I normally work with. So I still think it's super valuable so that everyone works with each other and not just the, their small group of friends or whatever, so that you get experience working with people you've never worked with before. Uh, I'm going to cut you off here. <laughs> so I think what you said, when, uh, going back what you said on uh, the skills you learn here in classes, I think it's to some extent it's uh, comforting for us because speaking from the outside, when you're standing in front of 30 black faces, you sometimes wonder whether anyone is, is getting or is, is uh, understanding what you're saying. Uh, my question is more uh, maybe to uh, both of you who are a bit more experienced. I'm a great believer of on the job learning and less of classroom learning. I think you learn more on the job rather than in classrooms. Uh, in your experience, what sort of sort of uh, how much was it on the job versus the skills that you took from, from schools? 
自分の雰囲気で I think that's an important point. Like when you, when you graduate from school, it's, it's really easy to just be like, I'm done learning. Because、um, there's no structure to your day. No one's going to tell you, hey, you need to learn this to do this assignment.、Um, but it's on you to take the initiative to learn how to do something. So if that's learning JavaScript or VBA to make something easier,、um, that, that's something that you, should, you need to take initiative to do.、Um, and the, resor- the resources are less structured. Like when you're in school, like, You have the library, you have your profs, you have your faculty to help you. Whereas, you know, when you're on your own, it's, it's harder. Like, there are tons of services like Coursera and things will make it easier at YouTube.、Um, but, but it's on you to, to go and seek those opportunities out. And I think、um, not having structure makes it harder and harder to do the more time you spend in the workforce. So it is easy to sort of be complacent, but, but you need to stay hungry when you graduate. Yeah, I would agree.、Um... I, th- I was trying to think how much you know, quantitatively it was from school. It, it's probably fairly equal as you needed your technical skills, but then once you're on the job, you're applying your technical skills, and then your career is taking off, and you, know, you may not be doing all the, the technical work anymore, and then you're doing different things as you move up.、Um, and I think on the job, learning is very important. Both, when I was, both my jobs at Deloitte and then at CMHC, I took every course. Every, yeah, every course that pretty much is available. I think took everything at CMHC, including French,、um, in order to advance you know, myself as far as possible as I could and not let anything hold me back. So, any of the leadership courses, anything in、uh, presentation skills, and, and all of that was, was really, really important.、Um, so, I think, yeah, the on the job learning doesn't stop, and it doesn't even stop within your own,、um, you know, where you're at, like at the company you're working at. Like, I joined different industry associations. And you're able to stay current with what's happening in the industry and, and with meeting different people,、um, you know, different government levels or, or in the banks、um, that are also economists. And, and hearing from today's economists like, speaking to you, and、um, it, it's really important to stay current if you want to keep moving in your, in your career. For sure. I think there's always some on the job learning, absolutely.、Um, you know, You'll, again, you'll, you'll leave here with all kind of the technical skills that you need, but you're, you're still, when, when you're in the job, I mean, there's always things that you can learn, and、uh, whether it's you know, a new program, new software, I mean,、uh, that, those are things that you can do、um, to get ahead, and absolutely.、Um, again, see what, see what the needs are within your group.、Um, uh, but again, but there's other things that you just、uh, you'll learn a, along the way. I'll give you, I always go back to my example in the public service. I mean, there's You know, I, I got there and I, yeah, I had to figure out how, how does government work? I mean, how, how does the decision making process work?、Um, you know, and so that's, some, that's something you don't really know、uh, from, a, from a textbook.、Um, so you get in there and you figure out how government works, and there's courses、um, on that actually.、Um, but you also learn along the way.、Um, and at, no matter where you go, I mean, you'll always have、uh, managers、uh, that are supportive, kind of continuous learning on the go. And whatever you need you know, to get to the next level,、um, I'm sure、um, they'll support you. I know that's the environment we have、um, you know, within the groups that I've Been in.、Um, but absolutely, I mean,、uh, but it's on you to kind of take that initiative, I think, and ask questions.、Um, you know, always look one step ahead. So if you're an economist and you want to be a senior economist, what do you have to do to get there?、Um, and ask questions. Learn from the people around you. I've learned throughout my whole career. I mean,、uh, I've always, I guess I've been a,、uh, a student. I've always been a student. I'm always looking you know, one step ahead. And I'm learning from the people above me.、Um, what did they do well? And what, did they,、uh, what, what are some things they did? Could, they could work on. And I, I learn from that and I, and I incorporate that into my style as a worker, as a, as a leader, absolutely. So I think it's continuous learning、uh, um, at all times during your career. Okay, so we have, we have quite a lot of time for questions. So I would like people to ask questions. I have a question for Sarah. So,、um, I'm really interested in your entrepreneurship a bit about it. And then、uh, I'm wondering、uh, what、uh, you think is the most important that you'll learn at Deloitte that prepared you for、um, as a successful entrepreneur?、Uh, at Deloitte? Yeah.、Um, so, working at Deloitte, you gain a lot of skills of all kinds from the technical skills you're working with Excel a lot, especially at the entry level jobs. Uh, you're doing a lot of the grunt work, and doing that grunt work is where you learn a lot.、Um, so,、uh, I did a lot, a lot of that, but they also working with clients of different types in different industries,、um, different places around the world, different.、Um, 
different levels of, uh, of clients, so the executives down to the managers and down to the analysts. I'm working with different types of people. Uh, you really gain a broad range of skills. I and mean, you also do a lot of report writing. So really, it would, I see my job at Deloitte as great training ground for the rest of my career, and especially as an entrepreneur where you have to do everything yourself. You know, at Deloitte, you, know, you had your manager was you know, managing projects and dealing with the clients and you you know your junior people are dealing with the Excel spreadsheets but when you're an entrepreneur you're doing all of it by yourself and you have to learn how to manage your time in order to get all that done and where to spend your time most effectively and working at Deloitte where you know you things can change all the time like oh no the deadline just moved up by you know, five days so what are we going to be able to do in, in the shortened timeline? And, and the same thing as an entrepreneur, like, oh, this person's deciding to meet with you now, so you've got two days to present, prepare a presentation or something like that. So there's a lot of skills um, at Deloitte, for sure, that are transferable, not just as an entrepreneur, but I think for the for any career. Um, for me, it was it was great great training. And they really focus on helping you develop as well through throughout your career, um, whether it's there or beyond. And they have a really good alumni network that I'm still connected with. Um, that they still bring you into and you meet other people who have left or people who are still staying there. So they're, they're a great um, place to uh, to start. They were a great place to start my career. So um, you look very relaxed. You had, you know, you went through the job market, you found your know, job search and you had several possibilities to accept jobs and job interviews and, and what I'm noticing and so obviously you're not there yet and you're kind of anxious about all this process but what I'm noticing is that you've had many jobs already like how long I mean the five of you have been around for a few years and already like two or three jobs so um, so I was actually curious about that because I'm interested in job search and job mobility um, and so my question was that um, if the process by which these job changes occurred was it like is it does it in fact the, the the question is should you just go and take the first job once you first start take whatever job and then after that it seems that so many other job offers occur uh, that uh, what matters most is that just take the first job don't wait too long and then after that is it the case that you, you 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 have opportunities to get more job offers? Were you searching for them, or did they just come to you? And uh, was it more, I suppose, a bit of both? Were you very proactive later on on the job searching, or or, or did it just happen? Like, can you comment on that? Before before you comment, I I have to uh, paraphrase a question because Sam uh, needs to get it uh, on uh, on my so. I try to, to stay true to the question. <laughs> so the question is about job mobility and uh, the process that you, you use, whether you use on the job search or you continuously looking uh, for another job since you, some of you have been moving around uh, quite a lot. I don't know if, uh, who, some of you have, haven't, but uh, Derek. I, I, can, I can start, sure. You're a good uh, person to answer sure. the question. Sure, yeah, I've, I've probably had uh, especially including co-op, a, a lot of jobs. Um, but for me, it was never, it was never like, it, I just sort of naturally migrated to the next job. It was never like prolonged. The only time that there was like, you know, pressure for job search was um, just based on geographic, like moving. So backstory, when I was in Seattle uh, and in California, um, my wife was part of a startup that was acquired. Um, so she wanted to reinvest those funds into doing another startup. The U.S. makes it very difficult to get an entrepreneur visa to stay in the U.S., so we moved back to Canada as a result of that. So um, that was the only time where I had sort of friction where it was like, I need to, I took a, I took a six-month engagement uh, at a consulting firm just out of need. But my, the, the best jobs that I've sort of found have been as a result of just out of interest, like talking to people, meeting the right people. Um, and just sort of falling into the, the right job. So it's not, it's sort of frictionless, I guess. That's, that's what you're asking? Uh, um, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think in general right now, the job market is very competitive. And I mean, I don't encourage you just to take any job. Um, uh, but uh, sometimes when you do have your foot in the door, um, it does open up other doors as well, too. Um, I think 
first principle is something that's kind of always um, served me well through my entire career was um, you have to like what you do, um, like where you're working. And, and if you do like where you're working, um, I think that's the only way you can really be successful. So if you hate your job, uh, if you hate taxation policy, well, then you got to switch. Or, um, But for me, in my case, though, I mean, I've, I've, liked, I've had about five or six different jobs within the, the Ministry of Finance or Infrastructure over the last uh, 10 years. But, um, but I've moved not because I didn't like the job, but because... Um, uh, you know, that's because uh, I want. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm pretty ambitious, and I, you know, you're always kind of looking at the next step. Um, and you know, I felt I've come to a stage in each of those jobs where I've learned as much as I can learn, and I want to keep learning and keep advancing, and keep progressing. Um, that's one of the attractive things I thought uh, that right from the beginning I knew about the Ontario Public Service. If you work hard and and if you want to advance. Um, absolutely, um, the opportunities there for you to do so. Um, so, um, so that was kind of how my career progression. Um, so, so one, once you're in, there's other doors that can open as well too. But, um, but I think if you so if you work hard and if you uh, you know have your sights on something else, you can do that. But I like you know I did like the diversity. That's the thing you can continuously learn. I mentioned uh, during your time wherever you're working. So, um, and so you want to keep challenging yourself. You don't want to keep you don't want to get complacent in your job. I guess like I could still right now be in the job that I. I was hired into 10 years ago if I wanted to. Um, I could be, I mean, a subject matter expert in that and just do that and only that. But uh, for me, that wasn't, um, I wouldn't be happy doing that. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, at certain times in your career, you have to make tough decisions because a lot of times you'll love your group. you like the work that you're doing. But again, you kind of hit that wall where you say, I have to keep moving forward. So you were um, proactive. You were I was proactive. I mean, absolutely. For sure. And again, I talk about networking and kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, I was like a student, a student of the ministry. I was always looking around, where do I want to go next? Or that job was kind of cool. I'd love to work there. Um, and what do I have to do to keep moving forward? Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I want to try it, uh, as many diverse as possible. Um, and as a result, I mean, being in a management role right now, for sure I'm a way better leader because I've had a variety of experiences along the way. Um, so, um. Yeah, I think um, what I'm hearing is pretty similar to my story is that the career progression happened because most of us are very proactive in making that happen. There's a lot of colleagues that may not be as proactive as ambitious to sort of keep moving um, and uh, moving to different positions and different and open to different types of jobs but um, it's up to you you know where you want it. like beyond school like up to you, you do school and then after that you're you know out there and it's up to you where you want to take your career right and so um, I think all that progression happened because we made it happen um, and I think if the veterans amongst the group, you know, we came out of school at a different time um, than it is now. Certainly it sounds like it's a little bit more challenging these days um, than it was then. Um, but I still think that if you're, you know, if, if you'll stand out if you, if you, you know, do the networking and you, I, I'm sure this is something you guys hear all the time, but um, you have to find, you know, brand yourself and find what makes you stand out and know where your strengths are and how can you apply that to the jobs that you're applying to. And from there, once you get your foot in the door, there's, if, if, there's always opportunities. And I, I truly believe that every job, any job, you'll learn something. If it's you hate it and you know you never want to do that again, or you get a horrible manager, and you know you know that you never want to deal with that type of yet or learning how to deal with that type um, there's always something you'll learn from from the different jobs um, yeah so for me I was at the government and then it was the same thing as I felt like I wasn't learning I was kind of feeling like a plateau almost so I decided that I wanted to grow and what really helped me was I had a mentor when I was at the government and that he helped me understand what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses and helped me kind of guide like what are good places to go and he had a network which he introduced me to several people so he made me go out for coffee with people from the bank, from Deloitte, um, just a lot of places so it wasn't that it was like pressureful looking for a new job, it was just like okay well if I find something I find something but I was proactive in looking for something new. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, if you do a very good job and then the opportunities come to you. So for my case that, you know, you, you do a very good job and then, you know, you, you, you build a very good um, uh, a image, you know, uh, like people know you, like your ability and then like later on when they have an opportunity, they will come to you. Like they know that you, you can do things. So they will come to you and to, to, to offer the opportunity. So sometimes that happens. So that's usually another way. And, and also like, 
when you uh, my advice is you know take the job the first job that you you, you take the first job offer you know and then that when you uh, work in the organization in the in the financial industry then you have the opportunity to know you know many op openings you know probably um, faster than, than people outside so that's how you know the openings and oh, you know the people and then like you have the opportunity to you know to know the probably the hiring manager that you can get an interview. So that's usually how you, you know, you can get. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I know, I was just going to add to that. It's true that the opportunities do come to you as well, and it's, it's one you stand out and you do a really good job, but you also want to evaluate if those opportunities that are coming to you are the right ones that you want to take at that time in your career. So I remember when I probably was a year or a year and a half into working at CMHC and I did a presentation with, um, in collaboration with the bank of the CIBC and Benjamin Tal, the economist, was presenting as well on the overall economy and I was presenting on housing. And he actually asked me, you know, do you want to work at CBC? Like, is there a great opportunity to work in the co economics department? You can do something more than real estate. And for me, it wasn't the right time. I felt like there, I could still put in a bit more time in the job that I was doing and learn a bit more and, um, and build more skills within that realm before moving on. So there are opportunities that will come to you, but you want to make sure you evaluate that they're the right ones. Thank you. Yeah, uh, about these soft skills, how would you recommend that we uh, showcase them? So obviously there's no certain you're a good teamwork, you're good, you're a good, you're a good uh, you're a person that can explain uh, technical concepts to non technical backgrounds. How would you sort of recommend that we showcase them? I know from past jobs that I do have those skills, but like really <laughs> showcasing them credibly in a way that convinces the, the employers rather than just saying what they want to hear kind of thing. I can, um, the first thing I do is so. Showcasing them is usually in the interview that you would showcase them and examples and then relay back what you were trying to say with those examples. So I always walk them through a detailed example of when I did teamwork and I uh, then at the end I always try to summarize my point, what I was trying to say. So from this example, I have teamwork skills which I could help you and then the value that you're providing to them. So usually that's the way I structure my questions to those behavioral type of questions is Give the example, then say what you like, summarize it, and then what's the value of that skill? So it's you the start process situation. Yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I echo that. that. A lot of that will come out in an interview. Um, there's always behavioral type questions, and if you can back it up with an example. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so in an interview, again, it's important just to be yourself. And uh, uh, one of the common uh, mistakes I've seen in interview, people don't actually like talking about themselves. Um, and actually, they sell themselves short in your interview. So the, the idea is you want to um, talk about all these soft skills that you have, give examples where you can, address the behavioral questions for sure, um, but don't come across as arrogant as well. So you got to try and find that balance. And just to add one more thing, um, sometimes what I do before an interview is I look at the job description, and if they didn't ask me a question related to something that I know I have the skill of, at the end of every interview, they'll always ask is there anything else you want to say? Summarize those skills back into there. Like they might have not asked it, but you should still showcase that you have them at that. Like that's kind of your last chance to really give them the final, like, this is who I am. The soft skills come out really clearly in interviews just from your demeanor and the way that you speak. It's it's very clear when you have them and when you don't. And um, and, and part of that is how you answer them. So, you know, I did this. A, B, C, uh, you can tell it that way, or you can give some context to, you know, it's almost like a storytelling of how that, uh, how that, how that, how, you know, you demonstrated that example. So uh, it comes across very clearly in these minutes. <clears throat> Sophie? Um, what would be the hardest or weirdest question you've ever been asked in <laughs> I have a list. <laughs> I'll forward it to you later. <laughs> Um, I've got brain teasers on the spot, like the monk one. So if a monk is going up the hill, if when the sun rises and then he gets there at the end of the day and then he comes back down, same thing, where, what are the chances that he was at the same spot at the same time? So they just really wanted to see my thought process on how I even approach that. Um, I've been asked 
to sit in a room locked up with. Um, they gave me, how are you gonna sell a garden hose? And so I was just in a room trying to figure out like ways of how I'm gonna capture that market, go through it. And then they come in after and they're like, okay, wait, there's this new hose in the industry that's your competitor now. So what's your strategy now? So it's just like, I've got really crazy questions. So. <laughs> Be prepared to just have a solution and really they don't they don't want the right solution they want to see how you come to that solution so walk them through the process so just don't say like oh I'm just gonna sell it in flyers no walk them through why are you gonna sell it in flyers and your whole thought process because that's what they care about those kind of questions get at judgment do you have yeah. good judgment yeah can you figure this out because right? um, <coughs> at any point in your job you'll always have to exercise good judgment so yeah. that's what they're getting at yeah, in the consulting world, there's a lot of high pressure. How do you deal with pressure and like tight timelines? So, um, I remember I in my last interview was with like the national partner or something of the group, and it was like, well, you want to work in an accounting firm, but you don't remember taking one accounting course. So, how are you going to handle that? Like, you know, and <laughs> being able to answer that question and on the spot, and it was like that was like the make it or break it question, and and how do you deal with that? So, those types of questions. Um, like high pressure in the consulting world, for sure. One, one other thing I'll mention too, um, where I work, I mean, the questions are a little more structured. They don't kind of veer into different areas um, that often. But um, one thing, be prepared. You know, um, the panel will have your resume in front of them, um, and so. A lot of times on resumes, you'll see other, other interests or hobbies or something like that. If you say you enjoy reading, um, you could ask, like, what's the latest book you read? And, um, I don't want to hear, well, you know, a textbook. Uh, so, uh, so be prepared to back that up. Or if you enjoy traveling, where did you go recently? I mean, that's kind of little side questions like that, but be prepared to back up everything that you have on your resume because they could ask questions about it. Yeah, so, so working in tech, you get some pretty unorthodox interviewers, and as a result, some weird questions. Like, I interviewed at, <clears throat> at Amazon. And one of the questions they asked me was, "You are a window cleaning company, and you've been you've been tasked by the city of Seattle to clean all your windows, all the windows. What's your price?" And they want one number, but they want you to get to that number based on there's a population of this. They live in a building that has this many. They just want to see how you solve that problem, not the right answer because they, they don't know. Yeah. Um, but also similarly, in terms of being being prepared to back something up. On my resume, I had a line item like product structuring at Direct Energy, and they're like, okay, like tell me a little bit about it. And they're like, I don't understand. Here's a whiteboard, go to town and explain, like thoroughly explain everything front to back. I want to understand the problem, and I want to understand your involvement in that. So just be prepared to elaborate on the things that you put on your resume and make sure that they're truthful, because people will call you on them, and it can lead to uncomfortable situations. <laughs> so one of the hardest questions I got was, Right after the interview, so like well, right after the interview started, right, shook the guy's hand, just met, and he's like, so we're launching our fifth product, right? We've launched four products before, and retention, right? How many people come back the next day after they first downloaded it? On the fifth product is half of what retention was on the first four. Fifth product similar. What do you do, right? So stared at him for five seconds, um, didn't know what to say at first, but the big thing that I hit on right at the start was, like, I had just started the interview, there's not much context as to what this role even is, so I was just like, what am I, do I have data or something? And he's like, thank you for <laughs> So sometimes what they want you to do is question the legitimacy of the question itself, right? So that question, there wasn't enough to it. So if you can create a structure to the problem itself, that's, a, that's super valuable. Um, on top of that, that question itself was like extremely, I mean, it's what I do now, right? Um, nobody tells me, like, go look at this, go look at that. I'm given this giant umbrella problem, right? People aren't coming back to the game or whatever the product is the next day. What? steps, where, what direction should I look in, what should I attempt, right? So giant umbrella questions like that, you have to create the st structure yourself. So that's a nice way of thinking about it. Yeah, I hope that's from now. So it's like almost, well, all of you mentioned networking, and I really believe networking is important. 
but for say a students graduating from our program with no previous working experience, it could be very difficult to establish network. So it's like start from zero. Do you have any advice on how can we start from zero? It's like, do you have any uh, recommendation on any platform or events we should attend or use? Um. Sorry, just uh, on network. I remember come, when I interviewed, like before I even interviewed at Deloitte, I went to a recruiting session, and you know these recruiting sessions. There's, especially with the accounting firm, it's all the accounting students are going, and you know you're one of the few economist students there, and you don't know who to talk to, you don't talk about, and you're there, and you think you have nothing to offer. But networking a lot of time is not about like here's what I can do. It's about finding common ground on something else that you can talk about, so you can find out about what you know, the company does, or um, you might, through that discussion, be able to offer something else that's unrelated to your skills. It could be, you know, oh, you play tennis there? I also, you know, play tennis there when I get, or something. You know, there's always some common ground that you can find, um, and especially as you progress more through your career to find out that networking isn't necessarily just about, here's my skills, and is it gonna match, like, that's not where it begins. It begins with, it can begin with other topic areas and other um, offerings and I don't know like as a recruit when you recruit like if someone comes up to you and says here's all this like right off the bat I'm not sure it kind of happened it's really yeah. it comes across as aggressive because yeah. you haven't formed a personal rapport right so I had someone actually the last time I was at Waterloo an engineer come up to me and say I know C plus and SQL and I'm like okay that's not relevant to me right now I haven't even introduced myself to you um, so I think yeah forming that common rapport and then just being personable. Yeah, be yourself, right? But there, there are industry events and like meetups.com I think has like, there's a data science group in, in Toronto um, that it, it's completely free and they're open events and you get to meet, you know, people who are like-minded in, in the space. Um, so, so find industry events and things that you're interested in. So for me that was retail, but I'm sure there are gaming events and, and real estate events that you, you can get into and, and start meeting people who are, who are like-minded. And I think the mentorship, what you mentioned too. Yes, <clears throat> and also Waterloo is known for networking sessions. Like all of January and February, go on the calendar, there's people there, RSVP, go and talk to people and just find out, go with the curiosity of wondering what do they do, what does a company do, and use that as a way to start conversation. Because I know it's difficult to go approach someone and be like, so, hey. Is just go up and ask questions and talk to them and then always follow up with an email as well so get their business card say thanks for meeting up if you have more questions go on a coffee with them and learn more so um, definitely take advantage of waterloo's networking events that happen and take advantage of all your professors networking uh, yeah. contacts as well too that's why we're all here today and, um, so i know i've chatted with many students over the years just uh, through contacts with professors so so take advantage of that. Um, if you're on a co-op term, for example, in you know Toronto, there's always a Waterloo or a, a events for co-op students. Go there and network. And uh, um, but there, there's also associations that you can join. If you're into economics, look at like TAVE or CAVE, Canadian Association of Business Economics. Sign up through them, and uh, they have a lot of sessions and speaker series throughout the year. Um, that's a great way to meet people um, as well too, and, and uh, get your name out there. But again, just be yourself, be personable, and, and try to find you know connections for sure. A lot of conferences too will have like free student passes or like if you so for instance when I was working in energy um, the Association for Power Producers of Ontario they do a conference and it's like three thousand dollars to go which as a student's a lot of money but if you volunteer as a reporter and you write like a small summary article for them let you go for free um, so it's a great way to get in and meet people and once you're there you can then work on the networking stuff I think friends are also very, you know, uh, important, you know, sources for you. Like, you know, friends know friends, and uh, some of them probably work in the industry that you like, you want to work in. So that's trying to know more people, so that's the first step. And then when you get into the industry, then you will know more people, then that's the yeah, natural networking. Yeah, and then there are many, uh, there are some uh, associations, that, I mean, uh, you know, in Toronto, like there's a you know a Chinese association, like you know that help you to prepare for the interview or know more uh, people in the financial industry. That's kind. Of, I can you know uh, introduce you to to that uh, association later if you are interested. Yeah, maybe in addition to that, uh, since last time I was like someone sent a message to me through LinkedIn, and he asked me for lunch, and he he is interested in valuation jobs, like quality of job. 
And I said yes. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was having the lunch with him, I asked him how many messages you sent out. He said it's a thousand. <laughs> and around 100 or 150 reply, and he made like 50 of us to have lunch with him. Mm -hmm. So he would know a lot of insights of what we did, and I would like to help him as well. So. Yeah, they could use a very uh, useful, you know, sources for you know for for the public to view your profile as well. You can view other people's profile and view contact, right? To send an email and like, to alumni or you know, it's, it's very useful. Yeah. Any also offering to to help? Like I think you mentioned the volunteer opportunities. Anytime you can offer to demonstrate something you can do to help somebody, the more they will be able to find ways to help you and remember you, right? Because. Um, then you're taking it one step further. So I know, it, especially as an entrepreneur, I've had so many people help me, but majority of them have actually been at like manager and above level. I haven't had a lot of students or um, come like interested in networking with me, but a lot of people above were like, oh, I'm happy to put together a strategy for you. And these are like directors of large advertising firms and because they want to um, hone their skills and they want to keep moving up as well. So it's definitely, uh, um, helpful when you can demonstrate something that you can do. Uh, I guess it's more for Sean. Uh, like, uh, when you, like, how valuable do you think like your PhD degree is in terms of your career path? Because. <laughs> <laughs> Like Be careful, Sean, a lot of people just do They don't want yeah, to find out the absolute distance of the quote to the Alexander. I understand, you know, I was very frustrated at first when I, you know, first to, to find a job, I was very frustrated because, you know, as a PhD, most, you know, the natural job path for, for us is to, you know, to do, you know, to work in a university, right, to be yeah, as a professor. But uh, I want to work in a financial industry. So that's my interest. So like, uh, so I just worked was there. I, 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 I took FRM CFA exam before my graduation, and uh, so for the kind of job that I'm working on, like I think the PhD um, study is very helpful. You know, you they like, prepare you for the to do the independent research. You need to do to read the uh, you know the technical papers as well as you need to you know to write your own code. You know, to write your own test model. It's very important, you know, for you to to learn these techniques when you are doing your PhD, right? So this is definitely a, a plus, you know, for you to find a job, especially in the quantitative uh, group in a in a bank. So the thing is, uh, you know, the quantitative um, positions in the bank are not many. There are not many. But if you know the people in there, and then like you know, you can show you have a strong skills. So you have a very high probability to get into there if you're interested. Yeah, I think it's helpful. <laughs> oh, that's one thing. This is like almost half of our team is PhD. So, <laughs> so with, I mean, Terence and, and Sean, uh, where you work in your industry, a PhD seems to be a big advantage as an entry point and also as a career. Uh, progression as well. Uh, as an entry, like to the in the uh, quantitative uh, team, yes, it's a big plus for you to have a PhD background and you have a quantitative skills on your techniques. But for you to progress, it's it's not the technique. Technique is very important, but also other you know the soft soft skills as well as you know how your, your business sense is very important. So for for you to go up, like you know, it's combination of many skills, not only the technical skills. So. Yeah. yeah. Also, PhD makes you easier to get into the industry since all the regulators they, they like PhDs. Since PhD would like have higher reputation. Like if I were, um, like I was representative for TD and Shen is representative for RBC and he she has a PhD degree. For sure, she is more reliable to the regulators. So that's why like all the quantitative teams they would like to have PhD. Yeah. I really have two questions. Um, looking back at your career, so what are some uh, rookie mistakes that you made that you wish you hadn't made or some advice you had going back? And second question was, uh, what advice would you have for us to sort of lock down on our niche, on our you know, speciality that no one else is going to be there? Like how, you know, just figuring out 
uh, what our niche is, uh, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think rookie mistakes is it's it's easy to limit yourself to like I know economics and I know statistics or whatever and try and and fit a job to that, but like. If anything should be evident from this panel, it's that we have a very diverse skill set that can be applied to sort of any job. Like, um, so, so that goes back to on jobs like filtering for economics. You're doing yourself a disservice because engineering jobs at like Ontario Power that are engineering jobs are are finance related, right? So that wouldn't show up on your search, but you should still you're still qualified for those jobs. So you should still be trying to get those. Um, what was the second question? Uh, yeah. Just, well, that is that actually answers both because our niche is that we can apply our skills to pretty much any industry and any job too. Like, look at just look at our all of our experiences. We have a, such a different type of path so far. So I think that's your niche. And actually, um, now that I'm in the consulting side, anytime someone's like, oh, she has an MA in economics? No, I need her in my team. So there's a really high demand, actually, especially now in this data-driven world. They love economists. So that's your niche, is that you can go and work anywhere and make it work. I, th I think the niche is yeah, being able to apply what you've learned into the real world, and you're already doing that in your classes. And that, for me, stood out. Um, when I was interviewing for my first job, I think they interviewed quite a few people from here, Laurier, Queens, U of T, and they hired six of us in the end. And the U of T and Queens students, I mean, no, not talking, <laughs> but you want to go But you were, like, when you got into, on the job, it was, um, wasn't just a theory that we knew. We could take that and actually, like, tell them why it's important or, you know, apply that to real world examples. It's translating what you've learned in the textbook to real world. Yeah. For sure. And that's that's the challenge. That's what yeah. <laughs> one of the worst people I ever worked with is a Harvard MBA. Like completely. <laughs> that's, that's not. <laughs> so uh, one big thing about your question, right? One part is rookie mistakes, the other part is where do you like where do you find your niche? I think a big working mistake is thinking that you need a tiny little niche, right? To dig yourself into a little hole. Um, in my experience, if you can position yourself, like if you the further you position yourself away from like a hard economist role, the less of a niche you need. Within my like the studio I work in, um, my niche is being the numbers guy, right? We're, we're a company with millions of data points, and this is a, an office with 50 people, and no one was a numbers guy, right? Numbers guy is like a huge umbrella term. It means so many things, right? Whenever someone gets confused about data, they come to me, which that is not a niche, right? But the further you are from the core of where the people you um, study with, the same background have, the further you are, the less of a niche you need. So that's something to keep in mind. Mohammed? Well, I wanted to put more emphasis on Christine's question about PhD. You know, I'm fourth year PhD student, and uh, every year, several times, I have this discussion with MAs, and they're curious whether to do a PhD or just finish their master's and go to job market. And it's always a big challenge, even for us, always I have these questions, you know, I did a master's, and then I started a PhD. Was it a good decision? You know, four or five years. If you know, some of my classmates and masters, they have jobs, they have kids, they you know, they are moving on in their lives. And uh, uh, but I'm still you know having this grad student life, and you know we have always this discussion and. It's not better off. <laughs> <laughs> Career? Kids? <Yes>, come on. <laughs> so, um, it's a matter of this, uh, you know, choosing between uh, continuing your education for five more years or whether staying with master's degree and entering the job market. So, in you are on the other side of, you know, uh, this field, and 
you have different viewpoints than us. You know, always the students ask me and I say, you know, I'm biased because I'm a PhD student, I have been here four years, some of us are tired, some of us are you know, frustrated, some of us you know, have different feelings, and so we are happy. <laughs> but happy, so you need to talk to different people. So now, if you could put some uh, vision or insight on this, so how do you see it? I mean, Sharon is a PhD student, I mean, uh, is a PhD graduate, I'm sorry, and uh, you are a master. So how do you see the problem? Before you answer, can I just add to this? Uh, was there any time in your career that you said, maybe I should have stayed longer a little bit and do a PhD, or was that not at all a factor? And you, you were very happy with the degree you had and the skills that you learned. So are you thinking of going back to school? Doing yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe Terence would be. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking like uh, for a few months after I, would, I have been working for almost a year, almost a year. Yeah. I've been sick of this question whether should I go back and take the degree. Uh, it's still a question for me if I want to progress with my current industry, it is valuable to get back to professors and continue the PhD study. But uh, if I'm going to move forward to other industries, I might be that useful. So I'm still thinking of that question. So it's open, so for the uh, yeah, half half. I think the question is like, you need to answer this question, right? It's up to you, like what you really want to do in the future, or whether you enjoy what you are doing right now, or you know, you are doing the research that you like, and that you, in the future I want to find a job that, you know, Related in a related area, like it's up to you, right? If you enjoy it, then you do it. If not, then it's. And you also can find a co op, uh, you know, internship in the bank as a PhD. You know, we have the intern, like, you know, who are, who, who's still doing their PhD, but they're still working. So you can find a balance. I, I mean, it's up to you, right? So what do you like and what kind of job, or I mean, a life you like? And, uh, and yeah, so my question was you know, to ask someone that has the experience, because I don't have the experience of working, you know. You have experienced it. I have experienced PhD, you have experienced job market, and MA students are asking between, you know, they are going to decide between these two options. They uh, never experienced any of them. So it's, you know, to make it clear for them you know. There are many opportunities, uh, you know, uh, these days, you know, in the in the banking industry. Like, you know, as a PhD, you have the opportunity. You know, um, there are many uh, jobs that you know, require you have a strong technical background. The thing is, you know, the PhD in economics has to compete with a PhD in physics, uh, in mathematics, in uh, you know, statistics. All those guys, you know, like they they need to compete. They are the competitor in the financial industry. Yeah, but the PhD itself is very valuable because you know, with it, it shows you have to, you have the skill to to do this job, right? So, but if you want to, you know, work in the academia, then PhD is a must. So, so it really depends on you know your own uh, interest. And, uh, Rob, is there since you work a lot with in data market yeah, data sure. policy, is there any time that you fall? This would have been a good skill to have. Absolutely, it's a, I think it's a, it's a good skill to have, and uh, for sure it sets you apart from others. I mean, um, majority of people kind of um, that I'm working with um, will have masters in economics. There's lots of PhDs as well, um, but uh, more masters, I'd say. Um, former chief economist of the province had a PhD in economics. Um, I know a few managers have PhD economics. Um, so for sure, it's a it's a very valued skill, uh, no matter where you're working, public sector, private sector. Um, at, at the end of the day, right now the job market is very competitive. Right? So it depends on what you want to do with it. Do you want to go the academic route? Do you want to enter the public sector, private sector? For sure. So you're looking for any edge that you can get to separate yourself from the rest. I mean, again. Again, uh, right now we're doing an economist level uh, competition, entry level, and I mean, you get a pile of examples, and I mean, yeah, there's PhD economics in there for sure, it does put you in another category, absolutely. Um, so you're trying to get every edge um, that you can get uh, to get yourself in the door. Again, it depends what you want to do. Um, I have a master's in economics, and uh, by the time I was done my degree, I had a bit of an academic fatigue, so I wasn't 
I mean, I loved economics, but I didn't, I was like, well, that's going to stop there. I want to enter the job market. Um, and, uh, and everything that's kind of happened since because you know, I've made it happen. Um, do I think that um, by not having a PhD is holding me back for my own job right now? No, but um, definitely, I mean, uh, it's a good thing, still a good thing to have. I mean, if that's how you got in or whatever, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's valued. We have time for one more question. Okay, I was curious about like how most of you are uh, actually saying that uh, you, your job actually dealing with a lot of data and stuff, right? And also like in our program, uh, we actually did a lot of assignment, uh, such as matter of assignment from SHAP and also our assignment from uh, SSU State. And uh, the way we are doing the assignments, actually we have a lot of the supplementary uh, notes from uh, professors and also like sometimes we run into difficulties and we can just uh, uh, communicate with other students to actually figure out our solutions, right? But uh, in terms of workflow stuff, you were saying that um, like you have to work independently, so you're not like having any help from other people. So my question is actually driving to like how like uh, most of you are uh, actually uh, facing those barriers and then actually overcome it by solving it independently. That Google is a very important <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious, I'm serious. Because you know, when you just start your job, like you will be given lots of uh, you know, documentations to read, and it's, most of the time you don't understand many of the terminologies, right? Mm -hmm. So you Google it, and then of course sometimes you discuss with your peers and your managers, but Google is a very powerful tool. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and then you need, to, you need to work, you need to, yeah, for small things, you need to find a you know, solution by yourself, but of course for the complicated, you know, uh, Problems you, you you have you need to have the lots of discussions with your probably team members, your managers. So that's how you you progressively know that you know know the know the job that you are going to do and know the know the a group know the industry. That's how you you can progress, right? You you get to know more about what you are going to do. So that's. Um, <laughs> There's always help, like like, but it's about more about you know you want to. Do what you can to figure out the problem yourself first, and then present to your manager. This is what I did. This is the problem. This is what I've tried, and now I don't know where. You know, I, I could use some help. So showing, demonstrating that you've done a little bit of that Google research or whatever it is first. I'm going to some of your peers and colleagues and say, you know, hopefully you're helpful, and then your manager will always hopefully be there to help as well um, at the end of the day. And if you're not in a place that where you know people are helping you, that's probably not a good place to be because there's always going to be help there um, on, on the job. You want to drive anything? I think you hit it right on. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll uh, conclude here and uh, thank you for all your questions and let's thank all the, uh, the participants. And before we do that, uh, let me say a little, uh, take two minutes before I present the, take two minutes to, to talk about our alumni effort. Uh, we are trying to organize quite a lot of events uh, in the coming years or this year even uh, to highlight the the importance of uh, alumni and your contribution is, is very, very much appreciated. I think you can contribute in many, many ways. Uh, money is not the only way. I think time has, is probably more valuable. So in the coming years, uh, you will be getting an email from some of us and I hope that you will respond positively and you will be always uh, welcome back uh, here. Uh, we are I don't know you'd like to use the word family. I don't like to use the word family because sometimes you don't want to go back to your family. <laughs> so think of us as a nice college roommate that you want to visit sometimes. And, uh, and again, thank you very much. Uh, Joanna has a uh, little prize that she wants to present on behalf of all the students to all of you. So on behalf of the Department of Economics and my fellow students, we'd like to thank you for taking the time today to come here and share your wisdom with us, which we really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you.